Okay, everybody, how's it going? <laughs> I've been waiting, waiting for this for a long time. We had a class last summer, it was our field trial, it went really well, so this is really our first full-fledged uh, class. So welcome everybody, you found the place okay, I see. We're still waiting for three other people, but I'm going to go get ahead and get started. We are going to meet sharply at 1045 and go until 1215 every week. Oh, my name's Ann Topping. I should have spoken to all of you. Uh, but uh, Dave McGrew and I are co-leaders of the Cornerstone Ministry. You from now on will be calling yourself the Cornerstoners. <laughs> <laughs> we like that name. At any rate, uh, let me go over a few housekeeping things. Please bring your Bible with you. This is biblically based ministry, and so we're going to be reading out of our Bible every single week. We will be going for 12 weeks. In a second, I'm going to go over the weeks and who's teaching what when. Uh, we'll be going through August each Sunday. The bathrooms are in Building C. There's a men and women's in there. I'll always have it unlocked for you. Um, we are filming at this time. One of the things I learned last year was that when people had summer vacations and they couldn't make it, I did all those makeup sessions uh, every week, and I did more makeup sessions than I did counseling last summer. So, at any rate, I want to assure you that uh, this is for anybody who wants to be on one-on-one -on -one help with someone, uh, or if you run a small group, a home group, anything at all. Um, this is just giving you some of those skills because I feel if you're here, you've been called. And like the little brochure said, uh, God doesn't um, call the equipped, he equips the call. And that's what we're going to try to do in these next 12 weeks is equip you with what it takes to be a good listener, to be empathetic, and all those other good things. Uh, we do have a book of uh, how to be a people helper. Uh, as a couple, you can just buy one copy. It's ten dollars. They're really actually fourteen. The, the church is subsidizing four of that for you, and uh, so uh, just give it to your spouse if there's two of you here uh, and decide who's going to uh, read it when. Don't wait till the last minute. You're going to be given at the bottom of your assignments uh, when to read the chapters. But this week, if you want to jump in, go right ahead. Uh, if you open your uh, binder that you had, everybody got a binder? There, I want you to write down, there's usually some places for notes. I got my cup. I, I walk a lot, and I'm, <coughs> Jim told me not to stray too far from this space, so it's hard for me. I use my hands and walk around a lot. My undergrad degree is in teaching, and so I love to teach. This is probably one of the top things I can do at this church, is to teach these classes. If you would like to get something in supplement to the People Helper book, uh, there is a wonderful, a wonderful book called Helping a Neighbor in Crisis. Helping a Neighbor in Crisis by Charles Colson. Or no, that's the four, excuse me. Lisa Barnes, Lampman. Lay Counseling Equipment Christians for a Helping Ministry. This is an excellent one. But if you have nothing else to get besides uh, the People Helper, there is a, this is my copy and it's very well worn. It's Quick Scripture Reference for Counseling. If you can only afford the two books, this is outstanding. So when you're searching to give it, it's called Quick Scripture Reference for Counseling. They do have a loanable copy at our resource center, but it's not for you to have permanently. Uh, John... Cruis, K-R-U-I-S, is the author, and he's far more modern than my copy. Very good. Uh, when I was a lay counselor, I was a teacher for many years uh, in the Bell System, and was a volunteer uh, counselor at the Ray Crisis Center, and for bad women. And they used Becoming Naturally Therapeutic, which we will go over a lot of them the stuff that's in this book. Very, very good. Uh, Jacqueline Small is very famous in the field. So, okay. Um, let me just say that uh, for our schedule, uh, Dave's going to be doing, if you'll get your schedule out, because it, it is in your, uh, I think it's the last two pages of your orientation. 
today's orientation, Dave McGrew is going to give you the orientation. Today's the day you decide whether you want to stay with the, the ministry or not. If you don't, please leave your binder. <laughs> Give you money back for the book, and we'll see you next year. Uh, week number two, Biblical Foundation, Ed Keefe will be doing that uh, class on the Biblical Foundation of this ministry. And then on week three, it's called Keeping Confidences. How to be confidential, because again, it makes me uh, stay up really late at night. My hair turns white. I bite my finger <laughs> thinking about people breaking others' confidentiality. If you want to destroy this ministry, just start gossiping about who you are counseling or helping. Or we, 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 I, If I use the word counseling, please, last summer by the 12th week, I finally got done using that, and then I started doing it again. But you are helping people. You are mentoring them. Uh, you definitely need to know how to keep confidential uh, information. So I'll be teaching that. Uh, on the 26th of June, you're going to be hearing Kathleen Keith. Now, Kathleen and Ed are graduates from the last class. And throughout uh, the time that you're here, you're going to see some of the graduates come in. And there's a week that we give testimonies about their experiences, not only as a person in CCW, but how they're turning their history and their recovery from whatever it is into a, being a helper here. Uh, so we're having a lot of the old cornerstoners from last year uh, come in and talk to you about uh, what it's been like this last year meeting with people. And everybody was really gung-ho the first week, and on the 12th week everybody's saying, I can't do this, I can't do this. We were really scared to sit down with somebody for the first time. Okay, and then if you turn over to July, on July 3rd, week number 5, recognizing your stuff. In other words, we bring stuff, our old baggage, with us into the meetings that we have with the people that we're trying to help. We can't help but wear a pair of glasses and see through them uh, our perspective, our experiences when we meet with others. And so it's really important that you know what your stuff is. Also, throughout this 12 weeks, uh, at the end of today, if you feel strongly that you want to stay and do this, I have a, a package, a registration pra package for you each to have, and I will be meeting with each of you individually and interviewing you and knowing what your background is. And we'll be talking about what kinds of ways that you would like to help, either in a small group, you know, like Linda and Ed are already doing the grief support group, uh, Robert and Christine is in our last class. They're doing the divorce care group. Uh, Buddy helps with our... Uh, CR. Well, it's not really CR anymore. It's life recovery. So, uh, some of you will want to start small groups. Some of you want to do individual, hoping a lot of the couples will want to do couples work as well. So, And then week number six, calming the crisis. People will always be coming in because something triggered it. And so calming the crisis is week number six. I'll be doing that one. And week number seven is giving support. And myself and a whole bunch of other people will be coming in about how to be supportive, how to give support. Um, and then uh, I also will have uh, Ray Johnson on the ninth week talking about the resources that are available in this county and in surrounding counties so that you don't have to panic and say, well, somebody who was homeless called me, or somebody who needs a bad homeless shelter called me, or, or this, that, or the other, somebody who needs a, a food pantry. So we'll be going over doing all those. Using your life to help uh, is in week 24. Uh, that is about, uh, again, more testimonies. Uh, week number. Yeah, you have, they're saying weeks instead of Okay. Uh, July 24th is week number eight. July the 24th is week number eight, using your life to help. Oh, no, that's the next week on the 31st. Oh, oh. So, two weeks there. Yes, two weeks. So what giving support on the 17th and on the 31st are kind of connected with each other. So can you say what week the ninth one was again? Okay, week nine is on the 31st of July, and it's using resources. Ray Johnson and Ron Carpenter will be here. Ron developed a website for us to go to as a, as a uh, resource for us. What was the 24th then? The 24th is using your life to help. And 
uh, that's week number eight, and we'll be having some of the testimonies from uh, other people that have already been through it. And in August, we just have three weeks in August that we'll be meeting. The seventh is a practicum where we start using our skills and just practicing. We're just going to be role playing with each other. Uh, week 14, the 14th, week number 11, is Randy Jackson's going to come in and talk about evangelism. Always, probably, maybe 60% of the people come in are CCW members. 40% aren't. So it's kind of recognizing when a person comes in, if they're churched or not, and get them hooked up and talking about the gospel. Talking about Jesus. Okay, and the last is intake and assessment on the 21st. Uh, we're actually going to talk about all the forms, the confidentiality form that people will be signing and that you'll be signing, uh, how to do an intake, an actual interviewing and getting information. And if you think about it, you're just going to just watch me when I do your intake. Everything I do, you're going to do. Just mostly listen. Okay, so that's that. Um, any questions? Um, Watch the clock a little bit. If, if we're getting too many questions each week, we might want to hold questions to the end. It's really okay to raise your hand and ask something if, if, if it's really relevant to what we're talking about right at the moment. Um, people always ask me, well, how many people are you going to assign me? And I'm going to say, that depends on you. You're going to tell me I can work with one person at a time or I'm giving you all you got because I'm retired and I love it. And I'm not going to overwhelm anybody, that's for sure. But, uh, but it's been my experience in the last two years I've been doing this is this is very short-term work. Uh, there's a curve very normal curve. People come in for three or four sessions, usually average. People who do, there are people who do shorter than that, and there are people who do longer than that, but they're the minority. So, uh, this is not long-term work, or you would need to refer to a professional, so we'll talk about that too. Any questions for me before Dave gets started? Um, June 26th, what did you call that? June the 26th is hearing pain. Hearing pain. Hearing pain. How to, you know, <laughs> I was in graduate school, I remember a professor uh, watching one of the people in our class and, and a male started crying <coughs> and that woman handed him a box of cleaning and says, right away, sending the signal is that she was uncomfortable with his cry. And so a whole lot of that lesson is about how to really be with somebody and be comfortable with somebody who's feeling a lot of pain and not to have to you know, bury it. What to do with people who are in a lot of pain. Because sometimes that makes it uncomfortable. And people pick up on that right away. That was a good question. Can you just give a little background on how we got into this? Oh. Well, I think a, a, it was definitely a God thing. About the time that the elders started talking about um, the need for a lay ministry uh, at CCW, I retired. I went to Dave that Saturday after they had the meeting and said, hey, I'm going to retire. I'd like to pick up sticks off the lawn or hold the Sunday brochure. And, he looked at me and said, damn, I can't believe you're sitting here in front of me. We just talked about doing a lay counseling ministry. Oh, no, I've been doing this for years. I really want to get away from that. But I do know that I, this is what God has me doing. It is, there is no doubt in my mind that he designed me and all of my personal experiences, and I have many, and I will be sharing with you, all of my drug and alcohol, all of my sin and all that stuff over the next 12 weeks. But um, there is no doubt in my mind that I was designed to be a counselor. And so I said, okay, can't run away from God. <laughs> I tried to run and Jonah. But uh, it has, so probably uh, about three years ago, I just started seeing 
of people. He would call me and say, uh, would you see so-and-so? I really don't understand about a rape, or I don't understand about this that again. So I did, and I just met downstairs in building C with people, so it would be confidential. And that's what you'll be doing. You'll be meeting, hopefully, someplace private. People are, want to go to a restaurant, but again, who's going to burst out and cry and really be themselves at a restaurant? I would advise against that. But we've got all this space in building C. It's completely devoted to C for, for our uh, CC our cornerstone ministry and, and for the 12-step the program and you know, for you to have to sit with people in individual rooms. Uh, but then the second year, uh, Dave, uh, Randy, and I, and Randy's wife went to Savannah, Georgia to the uh, Savannah Christian Church and took the training uh, to have this uh, cornerstone uh, ministry. And um, so it's been, and we officially did a class last summer, um, and it's been one ever since. We had 20 people start the class and 17 finished. Are couples going to be uh, deciding, side deciding amongst themselves or they're not there? If you want to work with couples that are struggling with marital stuff or communication or solving problems, that kind of thing, you can. Or if you want to meet individually. It's going to be a guy, guy, girl, girl. Oh, yes. Definitely. I will basically be receiving the phone calls. What happens is Kathy will get a phone call, or one of the white cards will have a check mark that says, I'd like some to find out more about the Cornerstone Counseling Ministry or whatever. And then I get that email or that phone call uh, from Kathy or Lois, and I call that person. And I set up the first initial intake with that person and meet them. I've got four people that I'm meeting with brand new this week. And I will ask them, why are you coming in? And sometimes I work with those people, and then sometimes I assign them to cornerstoners. And they know that up front. It's completely free. Nobody has to pay for counseling. That's the attraction sometimes, but that's a neat way of getting people to, to hear about what we do. We, they can give us donations if they want. I would never turn down a donation. But, Okay, I'm going to let Dave tell you about the morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you know who makes the best counselors? Screwed up people. <laughs> and and Anne talked earlier about the fact that we're not really looking to train anybody to be counselors. Well, we're, the, the actual title that we will have if you complete this, is a life experience mentor. And to, this sort of comes back to Buddy's question, the, the area that you would mentor someone in is an area that you have generally had an issue and recovered. You know, and you know, a lot of people outside of having drug or alcohol problems don't really think about recovery applying to them, but we've all got sin problems. We've all got issues in our life that we've, hopefully as we've matured, worked through. You know, we're doing this this uh, session on discipleship now, and part of our spiritual maturing is working through the sin issues that we have uh, acquired in our lives. So we all have something to share, and hopefully you all have all been sharing in some way or another. You know, as pointed out, several people in this class and, and the class before have already are already involved in ministries where where they are helping other people who are traveling the same road they've already traveled. Well, in some capacity or another, we've all traveled some sin recovery road, and that's the, that's the place that you can best relate to somebody else. And it's also a place that you've got something to share. You don't have to have a huge compendium of counseling skills. You have a life experience to share. And that's really what we're looking to do, is to take your life experience, pair it with a little bit of skill set on counseling, kind of beef up your, your abilities to hear people assess what's going on and to be able to better share what it is that you've been through so that you can help them. And that's really the biblical foundation for this. In Galatians 6, we're instructed to bear one another's burdens. 
and so to fulfill the law of Christ. So the purpose of the church, or one of the purposes of the church, is to be involved with other people and to be helping them where they're at. And Paul in 2 Corinthians 1 4 says that we are comforted so that we can comfort those who were in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive. So he's really describing this pattern we're talking about, where we have already traveled a path of recovery, we are now going to help others in that path. So it's, it should come very naturally. This is not something that is uh, real psychology focused or counseling focused. It's about your life and your experiences. We're looking to hone and, and amplify that message and, and give you a skill set for helping other people. <clears throat> It is important to remember that this isn't about you and me anyhow. The power for what we do is from Christ. Uh, Paul in Philippians said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The power comes from him and the credit goes to him. So it's, it's really important that you remember when you're working with people in any capacity that the biggest part of how we're working with other people is God's part. Now there's a part that you play and there's part that person plays. And it's going to be really important. We're going to try and help you to understand what is God's part, what is your part, and what is their part. You can't do their part, and you sure can't do God's part. All you can do is your part. So part of understanding the boundaries that go into any helping relationship is understanding what is your part, and what you are able to do, and what you're not able to do, what they must do, and, and understanding what is their part is important too because if they're not doing their part. You can't help them get any better. It's time to point that out and end that relationship or to, to somehow move it to a different place. You don't just keep meeting with people who are not doing what they need to do to get better. You, just, you can't fix it. So uh, the, the bold section on, on that page says this is not a humanitarian effort or a field group program. This is about helping people to get better. And <coughs> it's a service to God. We do it purposefully, prayerfully, realizing that it's for Christ and through Christ and any accomplishment that we achieve here is because of Christ. And therefore, that's where the credit goes. So the purpose of this ministry is to take uh, to create a ministry of gifted, passionate, trained, and mature believers. That's you all. So whatever doesn't apply, hopefully we'll get it there. <laughs> if you're mature, we'll try and get it. Uh, we're able to help other people who are struggling in, in their present life circumstances. And that doesn't mean that you might not be struggling in some other area. Part of the, the purpose of the interview is to answer going to be doing with you is to understand the things that you have already, you know, you're on the road to recovery. We don't ever consider that someone is fully recovered from any issues they've dealt with, but that you, you've made substantial progress on the road to recovery and therefore can help somebody else along that road. Now there might be another area over here that you're not really ready to help somebody else out with because you're still needing help yourself. So that, that's part of our task is to figure out what, what are the roles that you can can really help someone else out with. Christ had a ministry of compassion. We want to be the extension of that ministry. But we want to do it for the purposes that Christ did it. And Christ's purpose for having compassion was to link people to their God, to fi fix the real need that all of us have in our lives, which is a, a relationship with God. And we don't want to make light of the notion, but, but we, we operate from the belief that the right relationship with God fixes the problems of life. Now, obviously, that doesn't happen immediately. It's, there's a, this growth process, and that's this discipleship thing that, that Dave and, and the other teachers have been talking about. But that's, that is our belief. And so the answers are in the Bible. That's where hopefully you and I have found our answers in dealing with the issues we have successfully dealt with in life. And that's where we're going to be taking people. I like experience connecting to the Bible and to their God. And that's where the solutions are to be found. Um, we want to be a clear and present blessing to the community around us. So as Ann pointed out, a lot of the connections that we have in the Cornerstone ministry are not to members within the church. As a matter of fact, sometimes, I mean, I think it's an aspect of immaturity, but sometimes people who are having issues don't want to be dealing with their issues here. So they'll go someplace else to deal with their issues. Now, they need to get over that. 
and that's part of that, uh, if you were here for first service, to hear the characteristics of the spiritual child, it is believing that everybody else doesn't have problems too. You know, so if I believe that all of you are in pretty good shape, then I'm not very willing to bear what my struggles are. If I believe that you all are all struggling too, and you keep your mouth shut about what my struggles are, then I'm more willing to, to share my struggles with you and come to you for help. Uh, we also, we want to be uh, a blessing for the people within the church and the people outside the church to the extent that they will, that they will allow that. Um, so, for, for people who have partially experienced recoveries in, in their issues, you know, one of the things that we see in like the grief recovery group that uh, Ed and Linda have been doing just finished up its uh, first session here. And you see people in all sorts of places there. You have people in that group that have had very fresh, very, you know, by, by my assessment, really big grief issues. And then you also got people in that group that two years ago, their elderly mother died, and they're, they're having issues with the death. So there's, there, you know, whereas you might consider that to be a, you know, a, a small bump in your history. This person, it's it's been a major issue for them, and they're needing to get some help. We don't get to decide where the people have got their issues and, and problems. We can only do what we can to help them along the path with what, with, it, with whatever we have learned. Uh, the philosophy behind Cornerstone is the philosophy that drives this church as a whole, and that's found in Ephesians 4:12. And that is the job of the leaders within this church is to prepare you all, God's people, for works of service so that the body of Christ may be, be built up. We do not believe that the elders, the ministers, the ministry leaders in this church have got capacity to deal with all of the issues that are going to come, to this, to come this way. There's nowhere near enough of us or enough hours. And it is everybody's job within the church to grow up and to be of some value to the kingdom. So this is just one of many opportunities to get trained about a, a place that you might be able to do that and how you can use some of your experiences to help others. Uh, we've all been forgiven for our sins, blessed with gifts, talents, and abilities. Now it's, this is just an aspect or a way to use them. So our mission is to help people who are struggling, to give them hope, and to help them in that path of healing through Jesus, and to prepare Christians, some of whom are still dealing with their, their own issues and trying to figure out what God wants them to do, to use their gifts and life experiences to help others. So that's basically what this ministry is about. Anne was talking about the intake process. She really does all the intake generally. You'll, you'll learn about intake skills, but Anne does the intakes. She's the point person, and then she figures out, based on what she knows about each of us, where to pair people up. So she, she makes those connections after an intake so that, that you're helping, hopefully, a person that you've got some, some basis to help with. Uh, for many people, this type of ministry helps them better understand why God allowed them to go through a difficult circumstance. You know, many of the circumstances or, or challenges in my life have been self-created. So I can't ask why God did that to me because I did it to myself. There are things that happen in our lives that clearly we don't create. You know, if, if uh, you have a death of a child, for instance, I mean, there, there's a really big one for us. You know, if how do you deal with that? And how do you find purpose in a place for that? Well, you can find two groups of people that have had deaths of children. You can find people who have found a place in, a, in healing through that. And you can find people who have had their lives destroyed by it. And, and ultimately, on, on the last day, that's what you got, those two groups of people. And you either got people that are on that path of healing, or you got people that are having their lives destroyed. And what we're looking to do is to take people, no matter what the size or nature of their their issue is, how big that pain is, and to get them on that road to healing. And for you, 
this may help to put some of the, the hardships and challenges you've had in life into perspective. So you may find a better understanding of not necessarily why God allowed, I mean, it's, it may not answer the why question. You're, gonna, you, you're not really going to get that answer to that to a difficult life question. But you can understand how God wants you to use that hurt habit or hang up in your life to help somebody else. And that's, the, that's maybe the best we're going to do this side of eternity. Um, because we are made in the image of God, we are by nature created to live, love, laugh, feel compassion, and desire to help others. Those are all things God put inside of us. Those are also all things that can be abused if they're not used properly. Every one of our emotions can serve us well, or, or they can be a detriment to us. Uh, sin, which was not God's plan, but God's allowance, brought another part of nature into us. And that causes selfishness, independence, self-focus, uh, focus more on what life can give us rather than what we can do for others. Part of what all of us are doing as we move from being in the world and God's people in that process is trying to leave that nature, the sin nature behind, and adopt more of the nature um, that Christ had. And so all we're looking to do is to help in that process. We're, uh, the, this ministry is designed to help us focus on what Christ has done for us so that we might have such grat gratitude in our hearts that we're going to want to reach out and help others with the help that we've received. Um, as I said earlier, we're not looking to, teach, to make you better. We're looking to uh, <coughs> help you with the gifts that you've been given, that you already have within you, and to sharpen those so that you can use them help others. Uh, just because someone has been through a difficult time, and has compassion to help others does not mean that they're ready to help others. Okay, and that's part of what Anne's going to be doing in her assessment is see what your readiness in the various aspects of your lives are. Um, and that's some of what Dave was talking about this morning. You know, in our spiritual maturity, we can be really excited and enthusiastic and do a lot of destruction. So you really we need to see that there's been some real growth and spiritual maturity in an area where you've had a hurt, have or a hang up before we want to say, go at it, you know, go for it and help somebody else. That doesn't mean there aren't some small things you can always do to help. I, mean, uh, I think that, you know, I'll use the 12 step programs as, as a reference a lot of times because I learned a lot of this stuff when I helped start Celebrate Recovery here our life recovery group now because I've not had that problem in my life. So dealing with people who have got years of recovery after very destructive habits in their life, I learned a whole bunch of new stuff about what it takes to really help people and when people are ready to be helped and, and all that, those sorts of things. It was really an eye-opening experience. And I would encourage you if you've never, uh, you know, if you want to learn more about help people, just get involved in some of these the, the groups that are going on and see what's going on there. You will learn a whole lot about how people get better and what it takes for them to get better. Uh, so the, the training is to take someone who has a desire to serve God, a passion to support others through these circumstances, and giftedness and compassion mercy, grace, love, and to sharpen those abilities, but to make sure that you are indeed ready to do that. Um, and if not, maybe help you to get ready to do that, because that's, you know, we're all someplace on the path. Sometimes we've just entered the path. You know, if, if somebody has shown up for the first week uh, to the 12-step program who's dealing with alcoholism, we're not going to encourage them to be mentoring somebody else right away. Uh, it may take a while before we encourage that. They need to be mentored. So, but somewhere along that path of recovery, they become a mentor as opposed to a mentee. 
not that the need for mentoring themselves necessarily goes away, but they've at least matured enough that they can be of use to somebody else and not be destructive or drag back themselves in, the, in that situation. Um, each module is independent of the others, so one week's not going to be building on the other. All of them we consider to be important. So if you're not able to be here, please get with Ann about how that's going to get taken care of. As she pointed out, we're going to try and have videotapes. Hopefully that'll work before you be able to catch up on, on what's happened. Um, but we do consider them important, and we won't consider you a graduate or life experience mentor until you complete it. So if you're not here, you need to you need that really training, okay? Um, it, it's important to remember at all times, and we're going to try and emphasize it repeatedly, but this ministry is based on the belief that God is our creator. He's given us the direction, and that's going to be our source of counsel. Just like when you want to understand something about the Bible, a commentary might be helpful. It's important to remember that a commentary is written by men. And when you want to understand something about counseling or psychology, you might turn to a book. We're encouraging you to look at a book. But the book's written by men. Man's opinion, man's experience, never supersedes God's opinion. If God said it, that did say it. And now you need to come to agreement with it. And that is going to be our point of reference. The Bible is the source. And we're not ever going to elevate anything about um, what some people will call psychobabble, you know, the, 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 psych the psychology of the world is not what we're interested in. Now, there are some techniques the world has that will be of use, but we're not interested in worldly psychology. We're, we're looking to reinforce and teach God's plan, God's view, God's solution for the problems that you and I face as we help others. Uh, that being said, we expect you when you are involved in helping somebody that you're going to be spending a lot of time in prayer about that. You know, prayer indicates that you recognize that God's got an important part in helping that person. You spending a lot of time reading new psychology material would suggest that you think you've got a lot to do with that. I'm not saying you don't have some things to learn, but remember that it's fundamentally God's doing, not yours. And, and it's your experience that is already there that you're able to share with somebody. Uh, we also expect, and a lot, I think this sort of goes without saying, but part of being a life experience mentor means that you are maturing yourself as a Christian. So independent of whatever the hurt, habit, or hang up is, you need to be maturing as a Christian. You need to be doing the things that are growing you up in your spiritual life. You need to be involved in small group training, personal Bible study, discipleship relationships, so that you are growing up as an individual. Because a lot of the things that are going to be important in helping somebody else are not, you're not going to read them off a page. You're going to gain them in experience and, and sharing, you know, rubbing against other Christians so that, and so that you get polished your ability to do this. Uh, helping others in difficult times can be extremely challenging. You know, people look at the work I do as a hospice physician and they say, wow, that's, I can do that. Well, it's, it's got its emotional moments. It does have that. It's also the most rewarding medical career that I could ask for. So the rewards take care of the costs. We want to make sure that in your helping other people, you're finding a place where the rewards take care of the costs. Because there are costs to you, personal, emotionally, and in your time. Um, and, and what you need to be seeing is that good things are coming from your efforts. That's by involving God. It's by understanding proper boundaries. So knowing when to start, when to stop, when to shut up, when to listen. Um, those are all going to be important things to you seeing that God is actually using your efforts here to help somebody. And in, in seeing that, seeing the rewards of someone getting better, helps to cover the costs. 
So that's how we ourselves get taken care of, is making sure we're doing this in a way that, that we see positive outcomes. It doesn't mean all the outcomes are going to be positive. You know, there, we can see biblical examples of where Christ encountered somebody and they ended up walking away. The rich young ruler came to him and said, well, what do I need to do? He said, here's what you need to do. And the rich young ruler walked away. There are going to be people that you get paired up with who are not ready to get better. And this is one of the things I learned first in the 12-step in the groups that just amazed me. You know, I sit there with Buddy and, and others who have, have got long sobriety, and there'd be a new guy come in, and, and after an hour of sharing, we'd say, see you next week, and Buddy'd say, he's, he's not going to be back. He's not ready. And he also wouldn't chase him down the road. Because they know from their own personal experiences, and, and we all know this too, from whatever areas we've actually gotten better in, that we didn't just wake up one day and decide to get better. It's usually a series of starts and falters. And, and until you really get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you're not going to get better. In, uh, in the 12-step in the groups, they, you generally people say, I realized that I was either going to end up on a slab in the morgue or in prison if I didn't change my ways. And you know, sometimes they actually get some near experiences there before they before they change your ways. And some people never change their ways. And you can't fix that. That's a boundary issue. You've got to understand. You cannot fix that. You can't make those choices for people. All you can do is help the people that want to get help. And, and God has got to work on bringing conviction in their lives and hopefully a set of circumstances that will rattle their cage without killing them. Because, you know, generally that's when we choose to get better is when something bad has happened. And said that one of the weeks is about calming the crisis. We encounter people in times of crisis. So they come here and, and you're, you're walking right into the middle of their crisis. That's, that's usually when we choose to get better. Now, some people will have the crisis, they start to get better, and then they hit the road because they are over the crisis. They didn't get the message. And that's really what, what we see all the time in the post tech groups. People come in, they really aren't ready. They only think they're ready or they had a brush, you know. And, and they start rationalizing and excusing it away, and they disappear, and they'll show up a few months later after the next incident. And usually there's a string of incidents. How many incidents did you have, buddy, before you got the message? Pardon? Well, uh, you can't count them all. Uh, I've heard, and it's a long story, so you don't want to hear it. Right? My very first 12-step meeting was when he gave his testimony at 17. Yeah. And, and I mean, these are loss of jobs, loss of family, uh, jail experiences, divorce, crashes. Yeah, health issues, you know, all sorts of things. And and we all have different amounts of pain we got to have to endure before we decide to get better. Uh, now, not all the people that we're going to be encountering, obviously, are coming with behavioral problems, but the majority of them. You know, obviously, a person that is in the grief group isn't there because of a behavioral issue. They're there because of an event that occurred in their life that was beyond their control. But a lot of the people that come seeking help are there because of the way they're managing their life. And, and they need to learn the same lessons you and, you and I have learned about managing in accordance with God's plan so that they can actually experience the successes that God intended for them. And that's, that's what we're looking to do. Uh, so the reward comes from seeing people get better. And that's, that's our our payoff on that is seeing, seeing that God has been able to uh, use us in some capacity in his work to get people better. <clears throat> uh, so we appreciate the fact that you're willing to consider doing this and, uh, and, and hope and pray that you will find great satisfaction in your efforts to help other people out. The, my pages aren't all the same as yours. So. There's a page about ministry leader opportunities and prerequisites. Mm -hmm. Okay. We consider being a life experience mentor position of leadership in the church. Okay. 
you're going to be actually leading someone else down the path. Now, you may be leading in the sense of leading a small group, like that Linda group. Uh, but even if it's a one-on-one -on -one thing, it's still a, a leadership role. Um, that can be difficult, can be very rewarding, but we believe that it is a special position of responsibility. So we, as elders, have some expectations about what you're going to be doing if you're going to be entering into this leadership role. Uh, we believe that everybody has been gifted. I mean, we believe that God made you with some special abilities that I don't necessarily have. You have a different view of, and way of looking at things than I do. You've got a different set of life experiences. So, so you're very important to God's plan and purpose here. We want to make sure that what's happening is leading to success for the body of Christ here, individually and collectively. Um, since we are reaching out to hurting people, um, it is even more important that we who are doing this are living our lives in a way that leads to good endpoints. We don't, we don't need to be contributing more pain to people who are already having pain. Uh, so we're looking for those who have been there and now are getting some training to be uh, God's personal assistance. We expect that you are a member of the church and in agreement with the church's doctrines, which are biblical doctrines. We don't write a bunch of doctrines down. So based, our fundamental doctrine is we believe the Bible is God's word. And we expect you to be in agreement with that. Um, we, we want to see that you have completed the CC. I, I don't like to see these written as prerequisites. But um, the, the, the membership prerequisites that, that you've been through our uh, membership class so that you understand what our fundamental view of what the Bible says is and that you're in compliance and agreement with that and that you have been through the training modules that are being offered here before you step into this position. And that you are then relying on the resources that are within this, other, other people that you encounter that are like experienced mentors, or Ann or myself, or other elders or ministers in the church, when there are issues that you're going to those people. That you are regularly active in your area of ministry, that is this or other areas of the church, so that you are looking like God's person in terms of being a, uh, uh, a help to his kingdom. You are actively helping out his kingdom. And that you would be willing to be mentored if we see that as important. I mean, as I said earlier, there are going to be areas of your life where you're well equipped already to be a mentor. You need a little bit of information maybe and you're going to be set to go. We may identify areas where it looks like you could use some mentoring. And, you know, we're all, like I said, in different places, in different domains of our life. So if we think that you need to be mentored in some area, we would expect you to be open to that. That you display a commitment of personal integrity and devotion to Christ. This is not perfection. We understand that perfection is not what God is expecting from us while we're still alive. We also understand that perfection is still the goal. And that personal integrity in, in your works and your words is really important to doing this kind of work. Uh, so if you, if, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you've said something that you shouldn't have said or done something you shouldn't have done, we expect you to be straight up in, in talking about that. We don't, want, um, we don't want you hiding things that we need to be talking about things that can be educational points that need to be fixed. You know, it, it's not our job here to be shooting anybody that's not doing the job perfectly. Because none of us does the job perfectly. And if that was a prerequisite for getting anything done in the church, we wouldn't be getting much done. We are all, we all have our imperfections. And we all have our full pots. Uh, someone asked me yesterday, which we were talking about spiritual gifting, and he said, so, so you're a prophet? And I said, oh yeah. 
I said, and I'm sort of a refined prophet now. After about 30 years, God has whittled my edges down pretty well so that I'm not so rough. But if you ever want to hear some interesting stories, you ask Dave Pardue what life was like with Dave McGrew in the church back in the day. You know, because when I came here in the mid-80s, I was not a refined prophet. I was a prophet. And prophets tend to see things very black and white. You know, you're either in or you're out. And they tend to be very vocal about their opinions, which I still am. Uh, but I've learned how to work a little different. You know? I don't see anything any differently than I used to. I mean, it still looks the same to me. But I have understood how to make my message a bit more acceptable to the people that listen to it and not push people away quite as much. Uh, in, in my own personal spiritual growth, I know that God gifted me that way, and I abused that gift. So as a young Christian, I, was, I wasn't just lining up the bullets. I was going to machine gun. <laughs> you know, here, here Dave's talked about the, the Bible bullets this morning. Uh, and I could shoot you down. I mean, God gives it to you with enough brains to be able to talk you under the table. And I did a whole lot of damage. With a good heart, but I did a whole lot of damage. Uh, so we, we want you to grow up in your gifting, if you haven't already. And, and not that it's a done, done job for any of us, but... Um, that is that is our aim, is to help you along that path so that you can help others along. Uh, we expect you to be available and enthusiastic towards people that you are mentoring, you know, so, so that you're engaged. If you find you're having difficulty connecting to somebody, then hand them back to him. You know, we, we're not going to be perfect matchmakers. Okay, and if you're just not connecting with somebody, it's unlikely that you're going to be helping. So. I would say probably the overall theme of this past year has been that we are a team and we take a team perspective. And especially the first few times that you're working with someone, I'm calling you, you call with me, how's it going? What would you do different? It's just a huge learning experience. and. And we don't, any of us go out there and be a Lone Ranger. Right. Nobody. I called Dave a couple times this last week about uh, a person that I'm working with. And it's particularly challenging. And I don't want anybody to feel like they're carrying this load all by themselves. We are working together always, always, always. And, and we have some follow-up processes that we want you to, to observe in that respect so that some communication is happening. Because you're not, you're not out there alone when you get an assignment. You, you have resources. We expect you to be communicating and using those resources. Um, and we will also talk about how confidentiality issues fit into that. Because there's a way that you can get help without violating confidentialities that you should not be violating. It's also important to understand that most of the people that you're going to be encountering have already uh, opened themselves to end, so there's not a real confidentiality, <coughs> there's not a real confidentiality issue there. And so if you're talking to Anne about what you're encountering, the challenges you're experiencing, then then there's not any reason you can't have an open discussion. It's sort of like if, if I'm talking to another doctor that you're seeing, and you, you're seeing both of us, you know, a specialist or whatever, we can talk openly about what's going on with your care, and we're not violating any confidentiality in doing so. If I go talk to some other doctor that you don't have anything to do with, and I use your name and, and talk about problems, then, then I violate confidentiality. So you need to be real sensitive about where and when you talk, and talk about things so that we don't ever do that. Uh, and then we're just looking for continued accountability to leadership here. We believe that part of the membership is that you are in submission to the leadership that is here. We're not an authoritative leadership, but we do expect that that spirit of cooperation and submission be present for you if you're going to be in a leadership role. 
right? Yeah. Dave, I think this is a great ministry. I think it's already begun to snowball with the last class and this class. I, I know you mentioned the accountability issue, and you also mentioned that we're in the process of helping people heal. Uh, and you also mentioned sometimes we can cause some destruction. If that person perceives that there is some type of destruction going on, there's a concern of liability, personal liability, of, of uh, lawsuits. And, no. the, and the question that comes into my mind is, if, you know, if we're working within the scope of what's presented here, are we under the umbrella of the church's insurance policy if they do decide to sue? You're not providing professional service, and there's no basis for a suit. The, you, are, you are not a counselor. You're not off, being offered to the person as any type of professional counselor. You're being offered to the person as a life experience mentor, someone who has traveled the path that they're on. You're, so you're, you're not offering your, your time as a professional counselor, you're often as a friend. There's not any, I've never heard of a suit in such an area. That's not, and so when, when I talk about destruction, I mean, it's not that I don't believe that we can do it in somebody's life, but, but I can do it at work or with my neighbor. You know, I can, I can, well, he's not hanging out a shingle that says, you're a licensed counselor and you're charging for a fee. So no, no, yeah. Professional liability comes with professional services. No contract is over Right. Well, and and even if there was, you're still not, it's still not, it's still, there's got to be the offering of a professional service. Holding yourself out as a professional, and it's and it's not just about contracting money, but because you can volunteer as a professional and sell liability. I can take care of you as a physician, I'm charging anything still a liability for the care I provide. So, the, but, but we're not offering professional service. So that's not, the liability is not an issue. You're, you're not like providing corporate direction or needing board of directors protection. You're not offering professional service. So that type of liability is not here. Now, human liability is still there. Legal liability isn't. Human liability is I can still do damage to you if I deal ignorantly with your situation or callously with your situation. Um, so we, we want to make sure that that is not what's happening, but I don't think there's any concerns about financial liability. Most of this is, is hurt feelings. I mean, I've, I've done some counseling sessions where I screwed something up about somebody's feelings. That's what people are talking about in the prophetic. Hurt somebody's feelings, you said something that, yeah, I mean, somebody just thought was really inappropriate, they took it wrong, or, or whatever you just want. And another thing that you're going to hear emphasized repeatedly is this is less about what you say. You know, an awful lot of, of uh, the skills you're going to learn is about getting people to talk, you know. Getting them to talk and share, and then asking the right questions is more what this looks like than you offering some great insight about your problem. Because many times people know what they need to do. They, they need to be kind of shepherded along the path. And that's what question and assessment does. It's not, uh, it isn't that you're going to offer them the great, the great word or the, the, the sentence or phrase that's going to fix their problem. We can't fix their problem. So, uh, when, and the more you understand that, the less potential there is for any of this anyhow. Because if you're just asking a person questions, I, I'll, I'll liken it to when I, uh, when I became a Christian. I was raised in a church. So I knew, and I went to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I knew a lot about the Bible. And then when I uh, got my first opportunity, I dispensed with that. Now I believed in God, and I believed in Christ, but I had nothing to do with any of that. And I didn't, and, and if you looked at my life, you would know I didn't have anything to do with any of that. I mean, there was nothing about my life that suggested I was in a relationship with God. But I thought I was. That was the doctrine I had been taught, so I thought, like, I'm okay. And I just didn't 
that party. The, when, when I actually got my encounter with the truth, what happened, the minister took me out, set me down at a table at a, at a restaurant, and started opening the Bible, let me read a verse. He had me read a verse. He had me tell him what it said. If I didn't get it right, he'd get to another verse. And so he, he kept, you know, pushing me down the road without telling me anything until I convinced myself that I wasn't in the right relationship with God, which was rather startling revelation for me. If he had just told me, you know, you're not, you're not in a relationship with God, I probably would not have received that too well. But at the end of that evening, the only person I could hold responsible for what I understood was myself. He had written the scriptures down, he had said very little, he'd asked questions, and he sent me home with my list to examine what I had come to understand. I could not blame him for anything about my understanding. It was all me and the Bible. And I spent the next three days examining that and looking to see if, if that understanding was correct. And I got myself up. But I think counseling is oftentimes just the same thing. It's not, it's asking the questions and getting people to examine their thinking. We're going to talk about different types of ways that people deal with their issues and where they're at in their responses to the things that are going on in their life. And the games that we play, and so sometimes we're just helping people to get through their games. And, and start dealing rightly with it and looking at the, the various opportunities that we've got in response and what those things might look like in their life. And their path becomes clear to them on their own terms. It's not, it's not us. Okay? Any other questions for me? I'm going to be regularly present. Not always present, but so if, I'll be offering my opinions here. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so blessed to have David as a co-leader. Um, I'm now. These are the packets, the application for uh, people the ministry. Today to be a cornerstone life experience mentor. Uh, you would give this back to me in the next couple weeks. And the first are you have gone over the prerequisites already in your orientation, your responsibilities. We've been over that. Uh, then there's a covenant that uh, you would sign and date. Um, very self-explanatory. Uh, then on the next page under the application, you're going to put your name on. This is not as a couple. Each individual fills one of these out. All the relevant information, please write legibly uh, so that I can figure out what it says. Um, some of those three most outstanding life experiences <coughs> when they occurred might be those three significant things that you want to help people with. But again, in our interview, we'll go through that. Um, and then on the very next page, just to write a brief personal history. Um, I'll tell this on um, Ed when he comes next week. <laughs> Ed uh, took three weeks for me, three different sessions he through Ed's history because he wanted to give me every single detail. And I was glad to. And some people just take an hour with me. That's fine. Uh, but. Uh, if you need more paper than just that half page, that is fine. I want you to be detailed. I want to know your background. I want to avoid somebody coming to me and saying, gee, you assigned me to somebody in the drug and alcohol. Uh, and they said, well, yeah, they still smoke and join every once in a while. And I nearly fell on the floor. Thank God it happened early last year. So, <laughs> okay. At any rate, um, we are going to be asking you for references, too, so uh, 
there's a spot at the bottom of that page about your references, and, and then the last two pages are for your uh, letters of reference from someone. Now, if you, can, I don't care where these letters of reference come, people that know you here at church or family members, I don't care. It's not like it's a job that you're applying to and it has to be somebody in your field or anything like that. Uh, but there is a, a promise of confidentiality uh, that you will fill out. You promise not to gossip or discuss what people talk to you about with anyone other than Dave and I. Uh, and they are going to know that because when they do their intake, they're going to be told by me about the confidentiality of the program, but that I would be as the director of the program uh, involved in helping them make decisions or in whatever way that somebody needs to talk to me about what's going on with people that you help. Okay, and then uh, there's a personal data form on the back. Um, that's got confusing last year, so I revised a little bit, but if you've had marital struggle, uh, struggles, you're going to put sort of a date range there. If you've had marital separation, what was the date of that? If you reconcile, what was the date of that? Adultery, divorce, domestic violence. We're running through some things that uh, you might have experienced in your life. And so this, on, the, on the left side are dates and then any kind of details that you want to fill in. And again, put on the back of the sheets. I, I struggled with trying to save paper, and then I thought, no, I, I'm just going to have some space on the back for extra. If you just start and say, see the back, um, we'll do that. And then the last two sheets are for two different letters. So anybody, I really don't care who, I can just say, I think you'd be really good as a life experience member uh, to work in this ministry to help people. Well, I hope you get it from your mama. Well, yeah. <laughs> Somebody that knows you and uh, feels that this would be a, a great pairing of your gifts with the need that in this church that we have. Again, I can't emphasize that this is a team effort. But as like I said, there's 17 other people already in this ministry. Um, over the summer, this is going to be a lot of really neat classes. We're going to have an icebreaker uh, and get to know you more next week. Just be prepared to say a little something about yourself when you come back for the very first session about yourself briefly, maybe how long you've been here at CCW, if you're already uh, serving in a ministry, that sort of thing. And we recognize we did not open in prayer. So, any other questions? On the references, you have to put two references in the front number, then the letters in the back, and you the same, or is that the total? Yes, the same, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, Dave, would you please <laughs> close us in prayer? Father, we are thankful to you for the work that you have done in each life here, and uh, just pray that you would continue that work, that you would help each of us grow up and grow through the things that we've uh, encountered and dealt with in life, and that you, as part of your work in our lives, would, uh, would help us to use that in ministry to other people. Pray you bless each person here and the decisions that they're making with regard to this, that they would understand the, the uh, seriousness of, of entering and helping other people out, but also understand that, that is what you call us to in ministry, and that, uh, that we are privilege to be able to be part of your helping hand in the lives of other people. Bless each person who go from this place, help us to be mindful about the mission of your kingdom during this week and be busy about it. So your son's name I pray. Thank you. There is five dollars more over there than somebody signed up for books. <laughs> I want to stop by just to make sure that you did indeed put yourself down as having paid for a book. I'll see you next week. Have a great week.